What's up guys, Anthony and Bowie Tran here of Solid Tradecraft. If you're new to this channel, welcome. Me and my teammates go over everything Amazon FBA related in running our million dollar businesses on this channel. As of a couple weeks ago, I just got back from a trip in Thailand to visit my mom, with my mom to visit my girlfriend. She was out there teaching English and it was the first time ever I took my mom on vacation. You know, the vacation was funded by my Amazon FBA business where I import private label products that are manufactured in China to sell on Amazon. Now, my private label business reached the seven figure mark in a span of about three years, but I've seen people wait, do it way faster than me because they learn from others, right? So if this is your first time watching our channel, make sure you subscribe, right? Click the red button below, make sure you stay to the end of the video because it's gonna be full of advice that's gonna help you save time and money during the sourcing and shipping process, right? And money saved is money made, all right? So let's get into the common topics uh, of what we're gonna talk about, right? We're gonna talk about the common mistakes and some facts about importing and shipping stuff from China. So one of the top ways to earn money online, if not the best way to get a high ROI, is to import products from China, then resell them in the US or to your country through the Amazon FBA program. You can ship the items from China to Amazon's warehouses and then let Amazon take care of the fulfillment for you. But make sure you listen to these useful tips to you know really ensure that you guys go through this entire process for, so you can be smooth and comfortable and so you guys can understand how to deal with Chinese suppliers. So first off, as a newer seller, I would not suggest starting out with a gigantic order from a supplier that you've never worked with before, especially if it's a brand new niche and it's the first time you're selling this product on Amazon or if it's your first time selling on Amazon ever, right? Always order to test products first, right? It's best to start out with a minimum order if you can, even though that means you're gonna have lower profit margins, okay? Once you successfully work with the supplier and the initial stock successfully ships, you can work your way up to higher order quantities. I know some of you guys are going to be tempted to put down a lot of money on that first batch of inventory so you don't run out of stock and you have higher profit margins. But, but when you're starting out and learning business, I believe in minimizing your risk as much as possible within your first launch because I'm not saying like bad things are going to happen, but things happen on your first order, right? You learn a lot of things when going through this entire process, okay? Keep your first batch of orders between $500 to $2,000. In fact, sometimes you can go lower than $500 for a minimum order, but this is on the assumption that you already ordered, you know, samples, aka like a test product, you know, from your supplier. Any supplier that's worth your time is gonna be willing to send you, you know, samples, or a test product for your product, right? And you're gonna have to pay for shipping, but you know, it'll cost anywhere from say like 30 to $100 in most cases. And it really depends on how many products you order, the weight, the size, but make sure you get a test product, you know, a sample from any supplier that you wanna work with first. So keep in mind, it's always easy for a supplier to produce one unit that's super high quality, but it's another thing from going to produce one unit of high quality to producing thousands, all right? And so along the way, in addition to getting samples, you can get inspections done too. And I'll cover that pretty deeply in another YouTube video, so just look up my inspection video, and then you guys can find everything else about that, right? But the good news, right, is that most suppliers aren't going to have any problems with maintaining quality, usually. So you're not gonna have any issues, but by starting out small and gradually increasing your quality size, you're gonna safeguard yourself in multiple ways, right? In case like the supplier doesn't work out, uh, your inspection doesn't go good, or anything like that. Uh, starting small and getting, you know, is a safe way to get into the business, okay? Another tip, you really wanna vet your Amazon, or not your Amazon, but your Alibaba suppliers, right? And one of the easiest ways you can do this too is if you're using Alibaba, is to make sure you're looking at suppliers with good reviews. If they had several bad reviews around them, avoid them, right? And within Alibaba, there's a very easy section to see section where the reviews are. When you see a supplier that does look interesting though, right? Another trick you can do to make sure that they're legit and real is actually just call them. Hey, I don't know, this might seem obvious and you know, most people don't even bother to ever call the supplier, but I usually ask my team in China to call them, right? Or what you can do is use Skype credits to make your call. And this is one of the easiest ways you can call a supplier in China. Sometimes you're gonna run into the issue where the person only speaks Chinese, so just be aware of that. Another thing you can do is check their address on Google Maps. Yes, the Google Maps like sort of works in China. Uh, surprisingly, no Google has banned there. 
and what you can do to get an inspection company to do a factory visit before you place, you know, like an order and make sure they're real and like really like see what the factory looks like before you deal with them. The inspection company will also let you know if they're like a, a training company versus a actual factory, right? Which brings me to my next point. You want to work with direct suppliers instead of trading companies. Dealing with Chinese suppliers directly basically allows you to get the price at you know a better cost, right? Because anytime a person touches the product, anyone that's in between you and the supplier, someone's gonna get their cut, and that's just the way it is. Sometimes trading companies are good and they're reliable and they can really help ease the communication for you because they're like they make more money whenever like you actually place the order and the business gets going. Right? And that's why training companies can be good, but you're always going to get better margins working directly with the supplier. Okay? The next big advice I can give to you is to build a relationship with your supplier and your representative. Become their friend and put yourself in their shoes. If someone is rude to you, would you want to help them? And then on the flip side, if someone was helpful to you and treated you with respect, don't you think that would go a long way and you would want to help them more? So think about it. Be kind to the suppliers, representatives. Be friendly. Do their best to be do their best to be responsive, and let them know when you may be out of reach, and when the best time to reach you, right? And in terms of communication, right, with you know Chinese suppliers and their representatives, right? You know, one of their culture quirks is that Chinese expects suppliers expect you to be friendly with them, right? And they expect you to be direct in terms of communication. They like hearing and clearly appreciating. You know, like the products that you produce have been like really doing well and the quality is good. So tell them like the positive things, right? Focus on building that long-term relationship. They want to have more long-term clients and work with you in the future, ideally, right? So, you know, let them know when things are going good, right? And moreover, like when you're communicating with like your suppliers in China, I think there's a big misconception on like a language barrier, right? On English. Most suppliers on Alibaba have an English representative, right? Like I would say 99%. Most of them have an English representative. Not all of them speak perfect English, but they're gonna be there to help you throughout the process. So don't really worry about needing to speak like Mandarin or Cantonese or any variation of Chinese, because that's just not the case at all. Okay, but there are some things that you can do to minimize the language barrier and really help communicate, right? Use short sentences, do not include a lot of extra fluff, use professional language, and don't use American slang, or British slang, Australian slang. Use common words as possible, right? Don't use like big words that are hard for people to really understand. But also understand that a lot of suppliers in China, their English is taught with a British style, right? So there, there's going to be differences in spelling sometimes. So whenever you're, you know, dealing with packaging or, you know, inserts, like make sure you double check it and use a tool. Like I like using a tool called Grammarly, which it helps me with my Grammarly. It's super, super easy to use. And it's like one of the easiest ways to just be clear and upfront with your supplier. And I like to suggest that to my suppliers. I'm like, hey, this tool is like a really easy tool to like help you fix your English grammar. So when you're communicating with me, it's super easy. And then another thing too is it's really, really important to use pictures. Pictures and videos are super helpful for both parties and help reaffirm all the understanding, right? I like using this tool called Cloud App. It allows me to just like post a screenshot and I can like hot box something or draw an arrow here and then just really highlight and hone in on like, hey, can you improve this part? Or can you like, hey, like add like, you know, this insert here or like, can you like fix, you know, like a screw here? Like little things like that, you know, through pictures and videos are really, really easy ways to communicate. Um, I love when suppliers send me videos of my products. So I'm just like, hey, can you like show me like what's going on with this and that? And they're more than happy to do it. And finally, like one of the last pieces of advice I want to kind of close off with when communicating with Chinese is that a yes in China does not always mean yes, okay? So one of the interesting cultural quirks with Chinese suppliers is they don't really like saying no, right? Asians tend to be non-confrontational, and if you ask a supplier a question and you sense some hesitation, make sure you kind of ask the question in different ways, multiple times, to really make sure the answer is a yes. And if they give you a maybe, then that usually means no, all right? So keep that in mind. Do not go with a manufacturer on price alone, okay? Oftentimes, manufacturers who offer you the cheapest price don't explain why they're the cheapest, right? 
good manufacturers will explain why there's a difference in price, you know, because usually it's like different materials, different qualities, and the bad ones will just try to sell you a product with not really caring for long-term relationships, right? And at the end of the day, it's worth, it's always, always, always gonna be worth it to sell the product or to buy product at a higher price for better quality and for better, you know, service and better relationships like that, okay? And just a quick disclaimer. Most of my subscribers are looking to import products from China into the U.S. So there, much of my advice is USA Pacific advice, but I'll try my best to give everything in a global context as well. So just keep that in mind as you go through my videos and whatnot. But mistakes, all right? Mistakes is for US guy, us U.S. guys not using the metric system, right? In the U.S., we do not use a metric system. You know, we use foot, inches, blah, 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 but you know, the entire rest of the planet uses something else called the metric system, okay? So when you're working with your supplier, be sure you use kilograms instead of pounds. Be sure you use centimeters instead of inches, right? And this is just a general note to anyone dealing with Chinese suppliers. It just makes it that much easier on their end, right? If you can make it easy for them, they'll make it easy for you. Now when you're working with Chinese like, suppliers, you know, they kind of expect you to work on their terms, work around their time frames and their schedules, right? So that means like, Early, for us Americans, that means like early mornings uh, or late, late nights, right? So, and that's just how it is, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, right? You, we are getting our items ridiculously cheap compared to manufacturing in the USA or like in a Western country. So, you know, it's a good trade-off to work with them and just treat them nicely. Mistake number two, mm -hmm. not checking what duties you have to pay. So first of all, I want you not to worry so much about this because there's a simple solution for this and it's just basically contacting your freight forwarder and talking with your supplier but you don't want to accidentally get slapped with a tariff bill right and because you didn't know how to calculate your duties and you did you maybe you classified your product as wrong or you know like you just didn't have the paperwork right together when your item got to the border right so now duties you know it can be complicated but for example let's say you're importing like wool jackets to the US so there's not just one tax that's the supply to wool jackets, right? Okay, the way it works is like, for example, if the wool import was imported from like say Israel, then because the US has a agreement with Israel to import it for free, then the due rate's gonna be cheaper. But compared to like other countries they're importing it from, right? This is where trade wars happen, right? Maybe it's China or maybe it's Africa or some other country. Then the pricing could be higher, right? If it's made with like synthetic fibers instead of just pure wool, then like some of that can affect like the tariffs that you pay, right? However, you know, it's unlikely that you're gonna know all the answers to these questions. So I highly, highly recommend looking into this thing called the HTS code, right? And make sure your supplier understands what it is, uh, what code's supposed to be slapped on your product, and you double, 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 double check it with your fight forward to make sure it seems um, right, right? So the HTS stands for Harmonized Traffic a tariff code right and this is just like a code that's like universally used i don't know about universally but worldwide used to classify you know different products right different materials that are used and each country has like their own thing and this is just how like tariffs kind of work and how trade wars work and i don't know but at the end of the day like just to be clear the easiest easiest way to do this is to talk to your supplier and to talk to your freight forwarder and make sure they're on the same page and make sure you look at it and it makes sense right so that's the easiest way to get over it but i've had you know friends accidentally get into these like situations where like maybe they worked with the supplier and they had the supplier did the shipping and to like save money they like used a different tariff code right to try to save you money but they get you get caught at customs right so that is something you really really want to be aware of because in that situation, you're already gonna have to pay the client, not the supplier, okay? So keep that in mind. Then mistake number three, being afraid to just import because you're scared of making mistakes. Look, I understand that it's very easy to listen to this video and be afraid about importing because you're fearful of like making mistakes like the people I mentioned and end up losing money, right? Because after all that, if you screw up, it's gonna cost you money and nobody wants to lose money. So I'm gonna be honest with you. Even if you follow a step-by-step -step system, there is a reasonable chance that you may still lose some money from some random unexpected fee that you didn't realize you were going to have to pay. And well, honestly, that's just business and that's just life. And unfortunately, right, you know, in these situations, if you're not aware of like all these other scenarios, it can really eat into your profit margins. 
However, at the very, very end of the day, right? At the end of the day, like, you want to take risks, in my opinion. In my opinion, right? And what I mean by this is, like, if you're younger, like me, I urge you to be more risk-averse risk in your life now because you can always make money back, right? And you and throughout this process, you're going to learn so much, right? And learning is key when you're young. And But, you know, to be losing out on like the potential and like always thinking about the what if right that would destroy me right you know amazon is a hundred percent proven business model right that's why you're watching this video and there's so many people around the planet doing this right so you do need to eventually make that leap and stop watching these, these videos and take action right step up towards your goals right which leads me to my question for you guys have you guys ever done something really risky but it turned out awesome let me know share any experiences you had you know in the comments below Right, don't because like the thing is like the only way to guarantee failure is honestly is to not try it all. Right? Sure, learn from other people's mistakes, but don't be afraid to you know and don't make their mistakes, but don't be afraid to make your own mistakes, okay? It's all part of the process and this is how we grow and this is how we learn. But being part of a community that shares these mistakes and having people to rely on makes it that much easier, right? So make sure you guys join, you know, the group. The link's gonna be in the, group, uh, in the comments below. And then after you join the group, and if you wanna learn more of some of our battle-tested methodologies on how to launch private layer products, we have a free workshop coming up just for you guys, right? The link is gonna be in the description below and just under this YouTube video. So make sure you guys register today, right? Cause like I can't teach a room of like a hundred people, right? So it's gonna be a limited workshop. And these are my personal like methodologies for, you know, like understanding how to launch, understanding how to, you know, evaluate the competition, understand PPC and all of that stuff, right? So we're gonna go over that in the workshop so make sure you guys join the workshop make sure you guys subscribe to this youtube channel and make sure you guys hit the bell right to make sure you guys get notified of whenever any new videos come out either way you guys have a good day later